I'm Giovanni Singleton, Lunch Poems Coordinator, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you, you all here today. I invite you to sign up on our mailing list um, at the librarian's desk. We also have um, flyers for um, upcoming events in the spring semester. Today's um, reading is our last for the fall. On February 4th, we will have local poet uh, Dan Baum, and March 4th, uh, Pulitzer Prize winning poet Natasha Trethway will be here, will be joining us. Um, also, would like to remind you that um, we do have a sister program in fiction called Story Hour, and today's featured reader will be um, Mary Roach, and that will take place today here in the Morrison Room at 5 p.m. Also, on our website, um, you can view today's reading as well as all of our past readings um, as webcasts and also on YouTube. Um, we're also available now through iTunes. Um, the readings are typically posted within a week of the event, and we are also on Facebook, so please log on and become our friend. Really? <clears throat> Have your face in the place. So today, I would like to, um, to introduce uh, the introducer. Um, today we are um, pleased to have Brenda Hillman, who is an award-winning poet. She's published eight book, books of poems, most recently Practical Water. Her collection, Loose Sugar, was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award in 1997. She is the uh, Olivia C. Philipp Philippi um, Professor of Poetry at St. Mary's College. And also, um, she is the editor of today's reader, Richard Moore's debut collection, Writing the Silences, which is forthcoming in April. Please welcome Brenda Hillman. Thank you so much, Giovanni. I, I want to um, thank, especially thank Giovanni and uh, Bob Hass for doing this great series and uh, thank the, the library staff and uh, the administration of the library for keeping these two wonderful series going. Um, it's very important for, its for the community here and for the um, aesthetic uh, diversity that all, uh, both these series bring to campus. Um, and I'd like to add a thanks uh, to UC Press uh, and all the staff there for helping um, bring out this, um, the forthcoming uh, edition of, of Richard's poems, especially Rachel Birchton and everyone who's helped promote it. Um, and thank especially my co-editor, uh, Paul Eben Ebenkamp, who has been just wonderful <coughs> uh, to work with on the, on the selection. Um, I'm going to say a few things about Richard and just um, uh, hope to inspire you to uh, uh, listen and then uh, read his work for years to come. Um, I met Richard at a writer's conference. Um, it was in the late 90s. Uh, he showed up for an individual conference, as, as people do. Um, and he, uh, he was a modest um, person who brought a handful of really um, amazing poems. And I um, was struck by the quality and brilliance of the poetry. And um, I just asked him to, to stay in touch after the writer's conference. and. Um, and we did. We stayed in touch. We corresponded. I did not know who he was. I, um, you know, just corresponded with him. He was a, a guy living in Point Arena. And um, we corresponded for um, 10 years or so. And um, then uh, I was reading, because I was teaching the San Francisco Renaissance Poets, I was rereading re um, Michael Davidson's um, really wonderful book on, on that group of poets. And I came across the name Richard O. Moore. And so I emailed Richard, and I said, who is this guy? He's got the same name as you. And he said, well, that would be me. Um, so I was, um, oh, I guess I understand now um, You know some of, the, some of the things that struck me in his poetry. Um, where the freshness, um, the intensity of it, of the relationship he has to language, and um, the investigation into the materials of of um, of our linguistic um, power that we that we bring to poetry, um, it, uh, just a few things about about him. Uh, he was um, a student of Josephine Miles um, in the '30s. Um, he, he was born in Ohio. He came to, to Berkeley as a student. 
and he um, dropped out of, of Berkeley briefly, and um, he became active in the anarchist pacifist um, circle around Kenneth Rexroth, which was later known as the, as the San Francisco Renaissance Poets. Now a legendary group of poets, including um, uh, Tom Parkinson, um, Jack Spicer, um, James Broughton, uh, Madeline Gleason, um, and uh, Philip Lamantia, and some of the beat poets who later became beat poets. <laughs> uh, and it just um, it was a very fresh and important movement. Uh, it included um, interest in poetry of place and, uh, as I was saying, the materials of language. Um, and uh, a kind of um, process-oriented poetry that, that um, was, was particularly West Coast. It hadn't been seen uh, the likes of this poetry before, and Rex Roth himself was, was very special in fostering it. And Richard was one of this intimate circle, and he stayed in touch with all these poets as he moved into other fields. And he, Richard, became a very legendary um, pioneer in, um, film, in public television, public radio first. He helped found KPFA. He helped um, get KQED off, off the ground. And um, then he became a documentary filmmaker of other artists and poets and artists and writers. And it helped, when I found out so much about his, his life, it helped explain why he hadn't um, promoted himself as a poet, even though he went on writing, writing and writing for, you know, um, 65 years. And um, now he, then he recently retired to, to devote himself to his poetry full time. Um, and what strikes me about his poetry is that it has always been engaged in these same fresh investigations of philosophical nature, of the land itself, of language, of our place in the universe. And in the meanwhile, being on a quest, which is very internal and um, not psychological in the same way a lot of American poetry is, but in a different kind of psych psychological nature, which is a bigger philosophical quest through language. Um, I'm just honored to have worked with him and with Paul on this on this volume. Um, I hope you'll take a flyer, sign up to, to, to be at his book party opening, and um, you'll see a little bit of literary history that I left out there, which was the first po group poetry reading ever, which is um, with these other San Francisco Renaissance poets. So this is um, a kind of a strange circle that comes about. And um, he will be 90 when this volume comes out. And so I'm just honored and thrilled to introduce him. Thank you very much, Brenda, for that uh, eloquent and extremely generous introduction. When I first heard from Giovanni uh, with Bob Hass's invitation to read at this uh, at the lunch poem series. I was uh, honored and flattered by that. Uh, but it also sent me on a kind of a time trip back to uh, a time when I would come to the what I remember as the Morrison reading room. And the particular occasions I recall occurred 69 years ago. It's, that's absurd, but it's true. Uh, 69 years ago, about 1940. And I would come from uh, demonstrations at Sather Gate, anti -war an anti-war demonstration, which was not very popular at that time, uh, to the Morrison Reading Room and sit in one of their large, comfortable chairs, feeling a little bit guilty because the very chair and its upholstering reminded me of a life that I was set myself against. Uh, but I would sit there, having carried in a heavy briefcase of unread books, pretend to read, and just let it all fall away. And so I certainly owe an indebtedness to the Morrison reading room. I'd like to begin with um, two short poems, one of them of six lines, uh, the other all of eight lines. And the light here is not the greatest, but we'll see what we can do with it. Um, the first poem is titled Itinerary, and uh, it may or may not tell us something about where we are about to go. Itinerary. Is it possible to get any more light on here? So it, this is a, a problem of being so aged, of course. The, is the light the podium? Is 
Yeah, a light, uh, there isn't. There should be, but. <laughs> this will be the first poetry reading by flashlight. Now let's see what we can do this way. Here we go. Here we are. I'm, I've finally figured it out, or someone else has. Itinerary. Monologues of white interiors. Time dried of water and wind. Crowds gather in history's emptiness, weightless in the hollows of memory. Description without witness. So long ago lost. And the next poem is titled It, I T. Time was. There is now a different measurement in place. It has more to do with endurance than dimension, a property of stasis with people, animals, and wind rushing past, a watershed from which all things rush away. There is no becoming. Destinations have been proved absurd. It is a game of propositions. It is this. This is it. It is nothing. It is being, poised. The it comes loose from reference and has elsewhere to go. The next poem uh, has a uh, specific location somewhere on uh, Highway 1 between Point Arena and um, Fort Bragg on the Mendocino coast. And it's uh, titled Driving to Fort Bragg. The particular occasion for this hallucinatory trip was I was driving my wife to an emergency appointment at a hospital in Fort Bragg. And it was in a dense, dense, early, early morning fog. Driving to Fort Bragg. And this poem has an epigraph from um, John Cyril of uh, UC, which is the existence of the appearance is the reality in question. Inferred only, this time is history yet uncovered. Hawks on fence posts, even ravens, those acrobats. Fog has called a general strike along the coast. No thermal lazing, hovering, no tidying up by vultures descended from above. Through cataracts dimly, once winged enterprise, feathers tented against rain, these vision masters of the air. Headlights catch them in refracting dawn. Whatever their hunger, the ceiling will not yield. Bird shapes lost in the moment of discovery, as if light after millennia released, reduced substance to ash a part of the vast curriculum of circumstance and nothing. With yesterday's blinding sunlight, there withheld. So many questions fearful to be asked. Place this with the Pacific fence post posturing of hawks. And I'm, I suppose I'm supposed to pause between poems, but I'm I hope you don't mind my rushing on. Um, the next uh, sequence I'd like to read is called 10 Philosophical Asides. And uh, this derives from um, Ludwig Wittgenstein's uh, Uncertainty, which was um, assembled after his death. Um, and I think published in 1958. And the poem, each poem has an epigraph, or not an epigraph, a, uh, one of the paragraphs of uh, Wittgenstein, um, and then the poem follows. And the, and the overall sequence has the following epigraph. I am sitting with a philosopher in a garden. He says again and again, I know that's a tree, pointing to a tree that is near us. Someone else arrives and hears this, and I tell him, this fellow isn't insane. We are only doing philosophy. One, from its seeming to me or to everyone else to be so, it doesn't follow that it is so. We can ask, and in the asking, doubt finds its ground. The proposition itself is questioned. The red leaf I have brought indoors to say it is autumn dries before us. The red, changing, less red leaf is no proof at last. 
we are alone again. Doubt and silence holds its ground. And two, the difference between the concept of knowing and the concept of being certain isn't of any great importance at all, except where I know is meant to mean I can't be wrong. At random, aspen leaves spot fire the evergreen outside my window. Inside my eyes, that's where the spears are thrown. Yellow blades on the dark green needles of pine. Sun-struck bronze of Hammurabi's legions soon to be blood-tipped. How may I be wrong and at random say, I know as the wars go on. And three. Thus we expunge the sentences that don't get us any further. Surf backs into ocean after breaking bones. A tone of voice foams into rocks. Sound fulfills laws. Silver sheathing tricks illusions of surfaces, illusions of silver depths, all law-bound, formal as an ocean of lies. What point have we reached? Is there any place else to go? In what manner of speaking, may I ask? And four, overcoming a struggle with static electricity in pages. If we imagine the facts otherwise than they are, certain language games lose some of their importance, while others become more important. And in this way, there is an alteration, a gradual one, in the use of the vocabulary of a language. It is October, and rabbits fly amidst rising autumn leaves. The lake makes a statement. I, the I is not important, have never set foot on the moon. Some things are taken for granted. Of course he is who he says he is. I can tell by his necktie. And five, when we first begin to believe anything, what we believe is not a single proposition. It is a whole system of propositions. Light dawns gradually over the whole. Once only, under a rising illusionist moon, ethereal presences, traceries of a face, body parts plain, more odorous than photographs, or telephones slowly connecting, explicit parts revealing names, the sum of which the names of things wastes away as light dawns gradually over the whole. And six, our talk gets its meaning from the rest of our proceedings. Because it happened, I say a dog barking means the end of the world. I say this is the way it is. And then a dog barks and what I believe unravels within me and the shell of the world echoes the barking of dogs because it happened. This is the way it is. I say it may happen again. And seven, our knowledge forms an enormous system. And only within this system has a particular bit the value we give it. That tree is wise that does not up and walk away. True to the value given it, it bends and sways. One step over the line and we are stopped forever in silence. No matter that the mountains march into the sea. And eight. For may it not happen that I imagine myself to know something? Imagine the pieces whole again, fact and odds and ends, ends beyond means, a landscape with clear features except nothing to know, valley and plain, 
Silence against silence. Sound empties the ears. Unlocatable pain. And nine. There are cases where doubt is reasonable, but others where it seems logically impossible, and there seems to be no clear boundary between them. Like missed baggage, we sit in places that have names unknown to our claimants, who fret in other places at speeds and pressures that split all things apart a condition necessary, perhaps, to the birthing of stars, but fatal to simple pairing, necessary to recognition and the claiming of our own. In the final poem in this sequence, you must bear in mind that the language game is, so to say, unpredictable. I mean, it is not based on grounds. It is not reasonable nor unreasonable. It is simply there, like our life. Whatever it is, there it is, bent beneath the full burden of a life. Our language carries us. We are born to the equation, both sides equal. These words, these vows, this rising, falling breath. And let's see what time, I don't know, we'll find out how we're doing on time. What time is it? Okay. Um, the next poem um, is another specific poem. It's titled Dog in the Forest, uh, which could be a misleading title, except, and there's also a reference in the last line of the poem to um, something called the Noonday Demon. The noonday demon, as some of you may know, <coughs> was um, the uh, capital sin of sloth in the Middle Ages, uh, against which the um, church fathers exercised extreme diligence. Dog in the forest. A city in ruins as ever. In the forest, every scent comes arrowing true, a state of exception where the air opens up to death as everyone's property, thrown in the corner, a loose rag, the ultimate configuration of facts. When we were young and feral, we made our paths into the city, a sanctuary with doors and corridors. Then were promises and obligations kept like subway tokens against uncertainty. There were nights that continued ecstatic to morning, and the red of your hair dawn sprinkled you with diamond light. Can it be told when an ancient trace of faith gave way under stress in every modern word? Running through a melancholy of photographs and kitchen knives, have we no more than that which happens? There are paths that have left behind no odor of life. The city, was it a phantasm, erotically believed? Read the wind, dream a sleep of unknowing, lie down with the noonday demon. This, this next um, poem is part of a a long sequence uh, that began as um, literally as uh, 50 100 line poems. I quickly disabused myself of that idea because each line was supposed to consist of five uh, accented syllables and uh, it, it quickly found a more natural form in what I can only describe as runaway prose. And um, it's, a, it's a prose poem and, and this is number three of a series of about eight or so. And I should say something about the circumstances of the point. During the time that this was written, I was living a bi-coastal life. That is, two or three days in New York, and then the other rest of the time in San Francisco and Muir Beach in Marin County. And uh, this poem was, in a sense, a uh, the whole sequence is, in a sense, an, a, uh, a response or a reaction to the 
rather uh, ingrown, but nonetheless intense uh, literary life in New York City. Once again, flannel on the lawn at dawn, threats of purgatory rising with the sun. Why so early, double? There are pros who play this sport for blood. Yours will do. Edges of sardine cans await your hands. Caution is not the question. The question is who will be the last to be asked to dance? Watch out for the glare ice there ahead. Do not touch the brakes or the whole gazebo will go flying into the sunrise late for school, yesterday's uniform still unpressed and soiled. Stay on the phone at least until you hear the beep. Be sure to have your message ready. Helpless, the oars have been left behind. The stars not out, invisible in chill cloud cover. It's damn cold out here in the open tonight. No spooky moon glade to glide upon and sleep. And whose intention is it this morning to hang the jury before lunch break and jump ahead tonight armed with a veiled and chic beginning? Or to try another channel in seriousness, meaning now, today, remotely, but forever, right there, with the questions unanswered, is where reality begins and ends. Your turn next in the yard may come. Make the most of it. Keep those buttocks tight. Chin up for class and country, the old hometown. Yes, like a god of legend of a faraway, distant time. And it isn't a matter of shelf life. It's more a matter of shelf life. It isn't a question of packaging. A plea bargain is always possible assuming you can hold yourself together in the soup for a whole day and night and then show up again on the lawn, fresh-faced and vulnerable. Remember, there is no one minding the store. What store? Oh, just an expression they will use, rounding any corner, drenched and testy with the facts of life. Pretend not to notice that the big game is over, that the Masses have been moving away from home, except for the usual freeway snarls. Why doesn't somebody say there's nobody here but us neutrals? Which is not to say it is unnatural, only that it is nowhere to be found in nature, invented as we go along. But enough about you. A flame orange sun does not the cold Pacific burn. Not now. Be sure, be sure you have enough OJ for breakfast. Also, before birth, before death, before the common air, first cry, you should know this is a no-host bar. Oh, no. So much for that. Um, let's see, we have oh, some time remaining. Um, I, I read this next poem with some um, trepidation because it's, um, it, in, in, in one respect, it represents the closest I have been able to come to uh, that sense where the human agency inflicts upon another human, uh, the, un the non-human, uh, through torture or other means, which is all too common these days. And it's a series of uh, nine short poems called Holding On. How account for dimming of the lights, baggage of old age tagged and waiting, or light tricks in snow at sunup, waiting in line, waiting in line, come sundown, watching the horizon, eyes glowing. And two, who, not the other, myself, my prisoner, night flesh, ear skewered, music in natural air, screams well deep seep to the brain root, days, Treblinka nights, guilt guts the ferret in my cage, sanity puddles the floor. Three, in memory sickness, I, 
eyes unlace, open as last night's boots. A glacier of light saps the air. Remember, the torturer's tinnitus starts the day. The irrationality of it. Mob noise, angels struck from a block of darkness. A sunlit sky breaks through in shrapnel. Hard, screaming night. Feather touch. Troops improvising for the kill. Panic. My enemy. My nail hold. Of the texture of elbows shattered and stairwell falls, hallucinations of confession rush to stop pain. Andean snow stars blind me. The flashlight of the burglar of death flares and holds on my eyes. In the feast halls, ghosts linger, feeding, avoiding dogs and the memory of cracked bones. Present danger, colors hiss from a blue mask, bone bonded, autumn in no year's season, a nerve twitches across the path. Planets by lamplight, street laughter embraced in being, parallel lines collapse curbside, cornices fall from a stranger's dream, moon sand ears, the inhabitants lean in to hear. I say that's a poem which may not be as accessible as some of the others. But here's one that is certainly accessible. It, um, it was, uh, we were given an assignment one time to uh, um, ad lib a poem about influences. And this is what uh, came out. And it's titled, uh, I think appropriately, Divertimento. My metaphysical coyotes have pissed off and gone. I was Edmund's therapist when Lear looked on and howled. I am from Cherry Street on a wedding anniversary, a tenth year mistake. I have logged my four score and there is a Model T in my head. My prayer mat is a satellite circling a fire prone planet. I have seen the icons of poetry step down from their frames and deflate. I have felt the finger symbols of Kali seduce me toward death. I have been reborn with Elizabeth Bishop's disasters in my lap. I have heard states and the holders of power sing the same song, come, dilly dilly, come and be killed. I have knelt in the four dusty corners of my life and have been shown the bloody hands of the keepers of the promised land. I have seen enough to last for the life of a sparrow. And then back to um, perhaps somewhat more difficult poetry. Um, this, is, uh, this is a sequence from which the, uh, the book title derives called Writing in the Silences. And it was uh, of interest to me because the, uh, the compositional mode in, in this sequence is, I suppose you would call it aleatory, meaning a, a chance, um, luck, and whatnot. And I could claim that I, um, uh, first experienced this in working with John Cage and, and Merce Cunningham, but I'm sure they would be the first to say that I don't know what I'm talking about. Which is, of course, proof of what I was trying to say of the, uh, <laughs> of the discontinuity and irrationality of all experience. And this poem is, um, um, I'm going to read a small portion of it, is um, in two columns. Let us consider 
the cat's pajamas, an unfocused word sieve, a wordless Plato, a wish to live, I think. A word I, the appearance of, is enough to shrink the world. There will be no coffee following silence, no metaphor. The lies language tells itself. Minds random storms, calms, a climate, Mira, the moon, hail, passerby. In being, how goes the night, night? And one more section from that poem. An itch, God is not, otherwise inevitable. Faith, truck stop cry, oh rocks, unlocatable memory. Immediate in night, memory, an infection in air. Wind born, skunk odor, days after, the, the barely discernible road kill. Orpheus remembered, flawed with parts missing. And uh, I'd like to close with two recent poems, not, not, neither of them in the book. And um, all I have to do is find them. The first one is called, um, it, well, it's sort of a commentary on uh, the current state of uh, California and its um, um, economic state, and particularly as it affects the, the University of California. And it's a poem titled, Let's Party which uh, the lines uh, spoken by Arnold Schwarzenegger at the end of, I think it's Terminator 2. And if I can't find it, I may even remember it. You never know. Let's party. Where were you when the great bell cracked and we ran out of cherries for the Jubilee? It must have been a holiday. There are so many of them in the infirmary. Holidays open the door on happiness or so the brochure claimed. At least the flags are limp and no trouble for the moment. How we got here, main sheet and wing sail tattered, is not on the program as printed. Upon arrival, the charts were burned just to keep warm. And the final poem, I'm not sure I can remember this one, uh, it's titled Walking into 90, which is a very appropriate sentiment for me. Um, there's not that much to be said for it, for walking. <laughs> I'm not sure I can remember it. There's not that much to be said for it, for walking. In less than a mile, calf muscles cramp. Hydrate, hydrate. I know the rule and even follow it. But water cannot lift the weight of years. It finds its level, which is always down. And that goes on <laughs> to two more stanzas, which uh, in the failing light, <laughs> which reminds me of Dylan Thomas for some reason or other, uh, I can't seem to find. Um, but uh, I assure you, it's a pretty interesting poem. And <laughs> and, uh, we may have another occasion to read it, but I think that I am I've come upon the exact time in which this uh, reading is supposed to come to an end. And I very much appreciate your attention. You've been very kind, generous, and sympathetic, which is wonderful. So thank you very much. You know, Brenda, Brenda warned me that I might hang around uh, to answer questions, which I'm willing to do. That was beautiful. Okay. <laughs> if, yeah, I know some have to go to class, but I'm sure Richard would be happy to answer a few questions. And thanks again for your attention. Uh, I, it's difficult to see because of the bright lights out there, but 
You can shout out a question, and I'll, I hope I'll hear you. There may be no questions. You have a question, yes. Did you say that you were writing poetry all the time you were doing documentaries and other work, or did you start? Well, well there were times when I was more, oh, the question is, was I writing poetry uh, during the time that I was involved in radio and television? And, well, in the early days at KPFA, poetry was very much a part of daily life. Uh, and so I was writing then. Um, and uh, as I got into uh, intensive filmmaking, particularly with other poets, I spent more time reading other poets than writing. Uh, but nonetheless, I was um, you know, obviously influenced and affected by it in many ways. And so I did continue to write, but I didn't, I didn't have the luxury of devoting myself full time to writing uh, until I retired, which was in 1990. And uh, I've written, in terms of the book, it's probably most of the poems are from the 1980 on. Although there are some, including a poem for Tom Parkinson, which are included uh, in, the, in a section involved, uh, that presents early poems. Are you still living on the co North Coast? Yeah, I'm, I, uh, well, no, I'm, right now I'm living in, in um, in Mill Valley at a place called the Redwoods. <clears throat> but um, two of my kids live in uh, the Muir Beach and another in Point Reyes. And I still have a house in uh, Point Arena on the, on the Mendocino Coast. I don't go up there very often for probably obvious reasons. I can't walk around <laughs> as much as I once did. As we've been talking, I've been trying to go through here to find the, uh, that, um, the poem Walking into 90, which uh, I sort of uh, enjoy. And um, if I could, I could re remember only part of it. There's another poem which may be accurate, or <laughs> appropriate, not accurate, uh, for today, which is um, A Funeral of Memory. Brenda, in her uh, extraordinary preface to the book, um, has some very insightful commentary on this poem. Immaculately buried memory sets, unworkable as past life, retrievable at will. Thinking of God, I draw a blank. I say, enter thin needle of infinite night, and so it is, the set is over full. Calling on God, I enter the set called silence. Once in the labyrinth, old alley of no exit, there is only the center and the deception of place. Here everything happens and nothing is foretold. Listening for God, I hear my footsteps vanishing. Living in silence, I recall what I cannot hear. And there are a number of poems along that vein. Any other question? I was told that, 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 that at, at 10 minutes off, people were going to jump up and leave, but apparently not. Uh, Ariel, Ariel. Ariel, yeah. Well, the it, last poem you read, more or less, more or less answers my question. The question is, poem, writing a poem help explain your own life to you? Well, At various times, I've said that the reason I write poetry is to try to make the world comprehensible to myself. So that's kind of a, an ingrown dialogue of sorts. But it does lead me into an exploration of what it is that can be said and from whence whatever can be said may arise. Um, that's been a lifelong concern, the expressible. Um, and and, and it's, it's, I don't see it as a battle. I just see it as a, a given situation uh, that uh, the world is vanishing immediately upon our efforts to enunciate it clearly. And it uh, happens all too frequently. Yeah, another question? Is there a collection of the films you made? Oh dear, I made a whole bunch of films. Is there a collection of the films that I made? Um, San Francisco State has made something of a a career on uh, the outtakes from some of the films. 
Uh, the films have not been collected or released. They're tied up in legal rights um, by uh, PBS or not, WNET in New York. And, uh, but they do exist. I have copies of most of them. Uh, the, the poets included everyone from John Ashbery to Louis Zukofsky. And, and it was a wonderful, you know, it was pretty much a reflection of, the, of Don Allen's anthology, uh, which came out in 1960. And uh, I was immensely <laughs> moved to hear Bob Hass say that uh, he encountered these films while in high school and that they directed his attention toward poetry, which I think is quite a, quite a um, testimony to documentary films. Some of the films were better than others. Uh, I like particularly the ones with Ann Sexton, uh, Bob Creeley, uh, Robert Duncan, uh, Louis Zukofsky, um, some of the others less successful. The only person who objected out of the whole list of poets that I, uh, that I filmed uh, was Denise Levertov. And, and I think it was for good reason. She objected to being paired with Charles Olson in the same program, and I can understand that. Uh, although I was not sensitive to it at the time. Um, any other questions? Richard? Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to announce that the book will be available April 1st for everyone who okay. would like to read it. And there are other ones on the site. Okay. As far as I can tell, I think there's Rachel. Yes, uh, Rachel Burton, who's the, <laughs> the editor. Um, well, I never will find um, Walking Into 90. But it's a good poem, <laughs> one that I like. We can put it on the, on the internet. So thank you again. And